Good morning. Good morning, everyone. This is the continuation of the brown matter. And um, I'll not ask for uh, the browns to be re because, but I must remind you they're, they're, that you're still sworn to tell the truth. Council? Morning, Madam Chair. Morning, Commissioners. Morning, everyone. Thank you very much. Morning, Mr. Brown. Morning, Mr. Brown. Good morning. Good morning. We will continue our along the path that we had taken the last time. On the last occasion, you had taken us through the presentation, which is exhibited as CNLB4 exhibit, which to continue with the evidence at this time. You recall on the last occasion when we sat, you had, by virtue of the said exhibit number four, taken us through by way of summary, a number of documents. You had shared a number of comments and you placed reliance on a number of documents. Today, we propose to go through those documents with a view ultimately of seeing the documents in support, the actual documents in support of the statements which had been made by you. Now, just before we start, I just remind you, also on the last occasion, reference had been made to a number of documents. What is exhibit CNLB2? It lists documents, tab numbers one through 18. It is just a schedule of evidence as a document is titled, documents on which you intend to rely. And I wish just to remind you also that documents A through to N, which you had drawn our attention to, which are contained in letter written to the Commission of Inquiry dated June 1, 2020. And in that document, the 
items upon which you wish to rely are also contained. I just wish to draw those to your attention. Okay. I wish also, well, what I refer to the documents A through to 18, A through to N, I'm sorry, is contained in exhibit three, CNLB3. So we have CNLB2 that has documents one through to 18 and CNLB3 that exhibits 15 items, but they are, they have the designation of A through to N. I'm just reminding you of where we were the last time. Okay. Now, I make reference to the presentation which you had shared with us, and, and I crave your indulgence, Madam Chair. I'm just, I wouldn't say recapping, but just trying to set the stage. You had referred to what is CNLB4, your presentation. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to take you through that document and ask you to provide the documents which are which you are relying on in support of each point that's made. You had on the last occasion in relation to the said CNLB4 indicated on page two that your purpose was one to show how parties conspired to execute a plan, mm -hmm. that there are two major transactions which are fraudulent and that there are major players partnered to obstruct justice and you wish to present what we have and to share our conclusions. Just before I go any further, out of an abundance of caution, Madam Chair, on the last occasion, based on my application, and I know you had made an order in respect of adverse notices being issued to a number of individuals and or their estate, also some other institutions. I know that the order had been given in that regard. I'm uncertain whether or not they have all been served at this stage. However, out of an abundance of caution, I wish to, before we start, to ensure that we just revisit, revisit that list. So persons, can be made aware in respect of what is happening. Importantly, I would just ask, and I crave your indulgence. Out, out of an abundance of caution, because though we had expected from the last time that we were here, that these persons would have been served and or would have been in attendance. I noticed that we, that is not so. But I think out of an abundance of caution, I wish to go through that exercise again, because as we go through, if and when issues arise, these persons would have been notified and they would be given an opportunity to have standing and to put any questions to the witnesses based on the evidence which has been given. Certainly, counsel. <clears throat> at CN, we shall project it shortly, but at CN LB4, on page six of that document, it's been projected shortly. We had had, it's presently on the screen, 
we had at the top left hand corner Butterfield, the company, the Bermuda's first bank, were the sole executors. We have the firm of Cox Hallett Wilkinson Limited, who were identified as lawyers of Russell Levy Pierman. We have the company of Appleby, the designation that they were lawyers for John A. A. Virgil. We have in the second line, the extreme left, Mr. Eric Arthur Jones, the family lawyer for the estate of John A. A. Virgil. We have Mr. David Wilkinson, counsel Cox Hallett and Wilkinson. We have Robert Motier, Senior Counsel of Appleby Sperling Kemp. We have listed Mr. Russell L. Pierman, Justice of the Peace, former Member of Parliament. Mr. Edward E.T. Richards, MP and former Premier. We have Mr. John W. Swan, Realtor and former Premier. Mr. John Alfred Virgil from Somerset, a first cousin to John A. A. Virgil. Mr. Arnold Francis, a lawyer from the law firm John W. Swan Limited. And Mr. Leslie Earl Ming, then an associate at John W. Swan. I just wish to indicate that based on the record and the note that had been taken on the last occasion, Mr. Eric Arthur Jones is deceased and his estate ought properly to be advised based on the notices that junior counsel Mr. Swan will send out. Mr. David Wilkinson, deceased. Mr. Robert Motier, deceased. Mr. Russell Pierman, deceased. Mr. Essel, Ed Edward Richards, deceased. Mr. John Alfred Virgil, deceased. Mr. Arnold Francis, deceased. For the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I see Mr. Swan is coming, but I did speak with them. And uh, while the notices are prepared, I don't believe the notices have been served. But I suspect Mr. Swan is here. He can certainly speak for himself, but I suspect they'll be served today. Mr. Swan, I see that you're here. Um, we're talking to the adverse notices that were sent. Let me let you have a seat and, and uh, catch your breath. <laughs> yes, Justice, they are all prepared. Um, I just need to finalize the last names. Um, and then you'll be able to send them to me. Okay, they'll be served today. So that's the state of play, Council. Thank you, Madam Chair. Council, I don't know if you've noticed, but please give Mr. Brown a minute because he's speaking to to uh, PS. He has left his seat. Certainly, so if Madam you give Chair. Give him a minute, please. Certainly. <laughs> Thank you, Council. He has returned to his seat. No, Mr. Brown, on the last occasion, you had indicated that reliance was being placed on three critical reports. The Bermuda Police Report, 1976, a Bank of Butterfield Report, 1978, 
and a Bermuda Caribbean Engineering Consultants Limited Report, 1996. Going to ask you to, we're going to start first with the Bermuda Caribbean Engineering Consultants Limited Report, 1996. I'm going to ask you to take us through that report and you'll be aided by questions from me. Now, in respect of the Bermuda Caribbean Engineering Consultants Limited, a report dated the 24th of July, 1996. Did, are you aware whether the beneficiaries of the estate of John A. A. Virgil caused the report to be commissioned? Yes, they do. Just check if your microphone is on for me, please. Thank you, Councilor. Yes, it was the request of the beneficiaries to retain the services of Bermuda Caribbean Engineering Consultants to do the work that they did in 96. And the purpose of this report and the request what was the objective? The objective was to review and confirm title as well as transactions over the course of time that altered the title and the title within the seven acres of the footprint. And this report This report you have produced to us and you have labeled it Exhibit C, is correct? We have provided it. Uh, the C. Well, okay. you go ahead. It should be F. Be exhibit F. Okay. Let me just show you the report. Oh, can you have a look at that document? Do you recognize it? Yes, yes I do, sir. What is it? It is the report from the Bermuda Caribbean Consultants uh, in 1996 reporting on their findings as a result of their investigation into the property ownership of the seven acres up in Spring Benny. Thank you. Madam Chair, and, and more importantly, Mr. Brown, this was what was commissioned by the beneficiaries. Correct. That's that this document is tender and admitted as exhibit 
CNLB CNLB five. The carbon engineers report dated the twenty fourth of July, nineteen ninety six. Is hereby entered as CNLB five. You are going to go to this document. Certainly. Take us to page one of the document. Yes. And the it was prepared for whom? It was prepared for the beneficiaries of John Augustus Alexander Virgil. And the beneficiaries who had requested it? The names of the beneficiaries who had requested it? Sure, the names of the beneficiaries are Gladwin Ming, Glenn Ming, Sylvia Davis, Jewel Trot, on behalf of her late mother, uh, Marion Johnston, it's a typo there, it should be John Stun, S T O N. Miss Barbara Brown and Miss Marie Spence. Could you tell me who all these, these persons are? Sure. Gladwin Ming is a sibling to Glenn, Barbara, and Marion. And um, Gladwin is. So, the, just a minute. To Glenn, Barbara, and. Marion and Marie are siblings. And their relation to John Augustus Alexander Virgil? His nephew and niece, respectively. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, continue, please. And Miss Sylvia Davis and Eunice Trott, whose daughter was represented at this time, was representing her. They are the nieces, and they are the nieces of John Augustus Alexander Virgil and the first cousin to the other five that we just named. So Gladwin, Glenn, Marion, Barbara, Marie are first cousins to Sylvia and Eunice. So I'm just going to ask you, just take us through that one last time. Gladwin Ming, your siblings to Glenn, Barbara, and Marion. And Marie. Marie. And Sylvia Davis yes. is a first cousin to those we just mentioned, but a niece of John Augustus. Thank you. Now, in respect of this report that was done on the request of the beneficiaries, this report, what does it set out by way of introduction? Uh, it, it sets out the, the findings of how land came to be a part of the estate of John Augustus Alexander Virgil. It takes us back to, to 1885 and brings us forward. 
at page three of the document, might I direct your attention there, which starts at the heading purpose and ends on another heading chronology of land ownership. Yes. And just for way of guidance on the introduction, can you take us through that section? Says, this report it sets out the findings of how land came to be a part of the estate of John Augustus Alexander Virgil and the subsequent ownership and subdivision of that parcel of land. As ownership of land occurs in a chronological manner, this report has been organized in the same way. Relevant documents or correspondence have been annexed to this report and marked by letter. All plans have been identified by number. Where documentation is not available or research has proven inconclusive, this has been noted. Thank you. Now, on this section, contingent and limiting conditions, could you just share that with us? I know it's projected, but could you just take us through sure. that? It says the original title deeds and title deeds of the parcels of land derived therefrom have not been available. Thorough searches have been made of the applicable registries in Bermuda and the old parish vestry records, Supreme Court records, and the Ministry of Works and Engineering records. Information obtained from these sources has been relied upon. The determining of the authenticity of any recorded document is beyond the scope of the report. Now on the last occasion, you had mentioned to us here certain concerns and you made specific reference to the original title deed. Where is the original title deed? The title deeds are in a safe space at this time. And I'm going to ask you to, for the afternoon session, to, if you can, produce those title deeds. We'd ask the chair of the commission to verify that it's a true copy, we'll, a copy will be made and the original will be returned to you. So I'd ask you for the afternoon session to produce that report. And we intend to do so. Now, in respect of the said original- Mr. Mr. <laughs> Chair, Mr. Council, Council. Yes, ma'am. Uh, could you bring copies of the original so that I could note on the copy that um, once it's inspected, that it's a true copy of the original? Thank you, madam. You have a copy of the original or one could be made? Uh, copies have been provided to the commission, or what? a copy has been provided to the commission. Uh, it's, um, it's a fairly significant number of pages. Okay. Fine. So uh, we will have it verified at that time, Madam Chair. So concept was exhibit D. Thank you very in much. Earlier submission. Thank you. Now, on the last occasion, Mr. Brown, you had made mention of that very fact. You had made mention of a concern in respect of ownership which had been vested in persons in circumstances that have caused you, in my words, to think that something untoward has happened mm -hmm. because of the fact that you are in possession of the original title deed. That original title deed, can you say from whom it was obtained? Yes. Um, in 1880, uh, George W. Young uh, conveyed to Samuel David Robinson the subject property. And in 1885, 
same Samuel David Robinson conveyed the property to Augustus Virgil. So from 1885, the Virgil family has held those deeds. And that was um, referenced on page eight of the presentation from last week. Now before we go there, the, the will of John Augustus Alexander Virgil. Dated the, the well, 21st of May, 1964. I crave your indulgence. Can I have a look at that document for me, please? What do you have there? I have a, a copy of the cover of the May 21st, 1964 wheel that was signed off by Robert Moody. Okay. And the actual will, how many pages is it? You have a full copy there? Two. I'd ask Madam Chair that that document, which is the last will and testament of John Augustus Alexander Virgil, dated the 21st of May, 1964, that it be tender admitted as exhibit CNLB5. I'm sorry. It had previously been marked with Exhibit A. However, I wish to apply to have it ten admitted as Exhibit C N L B six. Is the date of the will the twenty first of May nineteen sixty four, Madam Chair? Did I get the date correctly? Is it the twenty fifth or the twenty? First. The 21st, Madam Chair. It's entered as Exhibit CNWB6. Thank you. Now on the last occasion, Mr. Brown, you had shared also with us the name of the executor of the said will. Who was the executor of that will based the, on your information? The executor was the Bank of N.T. Butterfield and Son Limited. Executor and trustee company. And just for clarification, you said NT, initials N NT. Yes. Thank you. And in respect of the said will, you wish to place reliance on it to what end? Well, the, the will provides um, evidence that he had a will in the first instance. It also demonstrated that Modia provided legal advice to our Uncle John and signed off on the will. The will also shows that Butterfield is the executor, the sole executor, as of May 21. 1964, and it shows an authentic signature of John Augustus Alexander Virgil. But well, what you purport to be an authentic signature. Correct. Okay. Yeah. 
and um, it also identifies the seven beneficiaries. No, just for ease of reference, Madam Chair, I crave indulgence, Mr. Brown. You have provided us with a schedule of evidence, something that corresponds to the documents and a explanation by way of purpose mm -hmm. of the documents. Madam Chair, there is a A document, it is headed schedule of evidence by letter or tab number reference, Madam Chair. It lists 18 tabs refer under references, a description of the item, a source and reference, and the purpose. That document I'm asking that could be and admitted as exhibit CNLB7, CNLB7, and I, so that the witness could be guided. And how, for short, how do you characterize this document, Council? It is headed Schedule of Evidence by Letter or Tab Number Reference, Madam Chair. I am advised that the commissioners have ought to have one in their position. Well, well, the schedule of evidence by letter or tab is hereby entered as exhibit C and B7. Thank you, Madam. Even though. Now also with reference to your CNLB7 that exhibit, you make reference to some other pages, pages 27 to 30. Madam Chair, in respect of what we have as CNLB4, the presentation, could you take us Mr. Brown, back to the presentation, pages 27 to 30. Mm -hmm. Certainly, uh, the, the reference to page 27 and 30 is merely to indicate for the commissioner's benefit how the value of the wheel fits into the story that we're telling. So it is the reference within the presentation when it's used. And um, I don't want to revisit the presentation. But Pardon me? I, I don't want to sure. revisit the presentation, but I wanted to indicate to the commissioners that pages 27 to 30, and then pages 48 and 52 of the presentation is where reference is made to the will, where we're relying upon the will to tell part of the story. Yes, thank you. Because you had gone through the presentation already, so we need yes. not go through it again. Correct. Thank you. Now, What's the second document you wish to rely on? Exhibit uh, B, 
reference B, which is the, the report from Betco, from the Bank of Butterfield uh, Company Limited, executor and trustee company limited, sorry. Uh, we'd like to rely on, um, or we will rely on that exhibit, exhibit B, which has also been provided to the commissioners previously. Kindly have a look at that document for me. Do you recognize that document? Yes, I do. What is it? This is the report um, that the Bank of Anti Butterfield Executive and Trustee Company Limited produced in response to a request from the beneficiaries to engage in an investigation on the true title. How many pages is that document? Nine pages. I'd ask that, that document, Madam Chair. Nine pages. Report dated the 1st of November, 1978. A report from the Bank of Butterfield were executors and the executor and trustee company limited. I'd ask that it be tendered and admitted as exhibit. I think eight. CNLB eight. So the report uh, to the beneficiaries from the NTB Bank dated November 1st, 1978, Executors and Trustees Company uh, is hereby entered as Exhibit CNLB8. Thank you, Madam. Now, Mr. Brown, can you share with us uh, why you're placed in reliance on this report or what, if anything, you're placed in reliance on from this report? Sure. This, um, this report was written by Appleby, Sperlin, and Kemp. Um, we've concluded that the chief author was Robert Modia, um, who was also retained as counsel by the bank, and he signed the will. Um, this report seeks to make the case that John Augustus Alexander Virgil earned no real estate up in Spring Benny. And it is our position that that is a false narrative and that the report seeks to prove that which is untrue. It also provides insight into the plan by Robert Modia, John Alfred, Eric Jones, that was targeting the southern and northern portions of the property. We believe that this report makes pronouncements regarding the authenticity and reliability of data that's used to prepare the report, um, questionable pronouncements. It also, in our view, does not properly address the historical ownership of the land in question. It, this report asserts that the bank had no legal obligations as executor until Uncle John died in 1972. This report does not acknowledge the Trustees Act of 1876, section 50, and the responsibilities that are associated with that piece of legislation. And it also, this report announces that during its investigation, uh, critical instruments that ought to have been provided to support transactions, uh, those documents are missing. 
So those are some of the takeaways for the beneficiaries from the report prepared by the bank and how it will be how it has been used in the telling of our story. Thank you. Council, if I can add, please, if I may, um, this report also demonstrates the, in our minds, the conflicting interests that um, Robert Modia would have had as uh, counsel to John Augustus Alexander Virgil, as counsel to, um, or providing some advice to John Alfred Virgil, and then authoring the report. Uh, we see that as a, as a, um, a conflict and it sets the report up for a taint. Council, may um, Commissioner, one of commissioners has pointed out that on this, in the schedule of evidence, page two of 11, um, the witness spoke to uh, the, the schedule and he used the, um, under F, he says, does not acknowledge the Trustees Act of 1876, but it says 1976. So, so I would like to know which is correct. Yes, thank you for that. I just corrected it myself. It's a oh, typo. Corrected. It should be 1876. Okay. Yes, it's a comforting observation. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Could you, could you just repeat that point for us in respect of the conflict of interest that you were sure. mentioning? Yeah. Yeah. Modia was uh, providing legal services to John Alfred Virgil, John Augustus Alexander Virgil, Bank of Anti Butterfield. He was involved in uh, the transactions and then he was invited to author the report that was intended to prove a false narrative. So he was, in our minds, attached on four different levels to key players who were not necessarily on the same page, so to speak. Thank you. You may continue through your schedule. Okay. The next item. Tab C. Is that? Thank you. 
But he said that. But it, it overlaps. No, Mr. Brown. I refer to a January 26, 1962 letter. Yes. Reportedly. written by Mr. Robert Motier to John Virgil. Yes. You have a copy of that. Well, I, not a copy. You have. I have a, a I'll call it a copy. Okay. Madam Chair, I wish to ask that that document be Tender admitted as exhibit CNLB 9. And this is the letter dated? The 26th of January, 1962. Written by Mr. Motier. Reportedly written by Mr. Robert Motier. To Mr. John <clears throat> Virgil. Uh, Council, if I may, I think it's instructive that reference to Somerset be made at this stage. John Virgil from Somerset. That is significant. Thank you. To John Virgil from Somerset. Thank you. Do I make a note of that, Council? Please, Madam. It is also contained in, the, I asked you to, but also in exhibit CNLB7 at page two, that reference appears. That was written to John Virgil from Somerset in January, 1962. Very well, it's so entered as CNLB9. Could you proceed by telling us the purpose for which you seek to place reliance on this document, sir? Certainly. This this letter from... Well, I'm sorry. Could you read it first, and then we, I'll ask that question now. Okay. 
the letter reads as follows. It's dated the 26th of January, 1962, which is a good day. Uh, it's addressed to Mr. John Virgil Somerset. It says, we enclose herewith our check made- so, Sorry, can you just go back after? Just read exactly as, as it appears here for me. We enclose- No, it says, dear Mr. Ver, I mean, everything has contained- oh, I'm, okay. Just sorry. read as, as it appears. Please quote RHM forward slash JWF forward slash V89, 26th of January, 1962. Mr. John Virgil Somerset. Dear Mr. Virgil, we enclose here with our check made payable to you for 1,025 pounds, representing the balance due to you from Mr. E. Jones on the sale from you to Mr. Jones for a portion of your property. I'm in sorry, September. it says of a portion. I'm just asking, just, just pay close attention. Of a portion read, of read, your- read, read from the actual document, please. We enclose herewith a copy of the statement from Mr. Jones to us, which shows the payment to us of 1,030 pounds. We enclose also our receipted account for the professional services for five pounds. And the enclosed check provides the balance of 1,025 pounds. We propose, therefore, to deliver the deed of conveyance to Mr. Jones. We will keep the previous title deeds to the property for the time being, since Mr. Jones will be preparing a covenant for production, which our Mr. Modia discussed with you at your recent interview. Yours faithfully, Robert H. Modia. Thank you. And the, <clears throat> excuse me, the purpose for which you seek to rely on this document, could you share with us? Certainly. Um, we believe that this document shows that Robert Modia wrote to John Virgil from Somerset in 1962, wrote to him about the Southern portion. It shows the relationship between Modia and Jones and it shows the character of both of the lawyers. And when you say character, what do you mean? I mean that Eric Jones was less than a month ago, or just over a month ago, signing off an indictment. A month ago. Mm -hmm. a, a month, month ago, prior well, to in October last year. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, a, a month, just over a month prior to. January 26, 1962, when this letter was drafted, Robert, um, Eric Jones would have been a witness to a December 9, 1961 indenture that granted John Augustus Alexander Virgil ownership of the subject property. Eric um, Jones is now sharing correspondence with Robert Modia, discussing transactions on the Southern portion, completely unrelated to the transaction of December 9th, 1961. And so given that Jones was at the table, involved in witnessing the transaction in 1961, we submit that that represents evidence of low integrity. Uh, it also discusses the consideration of 1,025 pounds to support the ownership claim. This letter speaks to the need for a deed of conveyance, and it confirms that a covenant was being prepared by Eric Jones on the future of the Southern portion. It also confirms that Modia and John Virgil from Somerset at the time had recently held a meeting about this, uh, an interview about this matter. 
It also shows that family lawyer Eric Jones was engaged in what we call a back channel to claim ownership to the southern portion. And this should be considered alongside the two letters from December of 1961, which were written and sent a few days after. The Virgil family signed off on the December 9th, 1961 indenture. So this letter, which we call the covenant, is uh, quite instrumental in connecting the dots in our story, and that this was drafted soon after the December 9th indenture. But there's also a piece to this story where David Wilkinson later on claims that Eric purchased this property from John Augustus Alexander Virgil. Now, he couldn't have purchased it from both. But the documentation suggests that there was a purchase by Eric Jones from both John Virgil of Somerset and from John Augustus Alexander Virgil. And while it is possible, it didn't happen with this southern portion in January of 1962. Thank you. You just mentioned that the document purports to show that the family lawyer, Eric Arthur Jones, engaged in a back channel to claim ownership of the southern portion of the property. What do you mean by engaging in a back channel? What we mean by engaging in a, in a back channel is that while we don't know precisely what was being planned, because this was not something that was put in front of us, this was activities that were kept from the, the beneficiaries and the family, it's a conclusion we've drawn based on the information that we see. We see Eric Jones at the table on December 9th. We see Eric Jones writing to family members who signed off on the December 9th transaction. We see him writing to them December the 12th and December the 22nd. That's what we know of. There's perhaps correspondence that we do not know of, but we don't wish to speculate. But those two letters, along with this one from January 26, have caused us to believe that Jones was running a parallel mission, uh, a back channel, if you wish, to lay claim to the southern portion. It wasn't up front. It wasn't on the table as the December 9, 1961 transaction was. Thank you. And Please go ahead. Certainly. Um, another instrumental piece at this time that I'd like to remind the commissioners of is the flurry of conveyances that Eric Jones and John Roger from Somerset signed off on prior to December, uh, uh, around December 9th, 1961, and through December of 1962. That is also in your the presentation, and it is page 24 is the, the flurry of conveyances that add to our part of the story where Eric Jones was misbehaving. Craven Dungeons. I'm just having the screen project the reference that's being made by the witness to exhibit. CNLB4 at page 24. 
Right. Is is that what reference is being made to? Yes, but count if the CNL B four does not have a point number four. It um, it has three. Yeah, I would just prefer that we use that which was submitted. made an exhibit. Yes. So yes, that I is assume it was same. You're correct. The the exhibit does not have a number four as is exhibited there. So I, I'll remove it and rely on the document. I was trying to assist the commissioners. But we can, we can use the file that was presented to the commissioners last week, which is available through this um, medium. Um, so- Oh, you can project it? Yes. Okay. Okay, I, I'll, I'll allow you to project it because you're correct. That, that which was displayed was yeah. not an accurate reflection of the exhibit CNLB4. Crave indulgence, I'm just relying on the document projected. Waiting. No, the document part of CNLB4 at page 24, which is projected on the screen. You're, you make reference to this document having been asked by me what was meant by shows the family lawyer Eric Arthur Jones engaged in a back channel to claim ownership the southern portion of the property. You have drawn our attention to this page. For what purpose? To, to show. Want to show that after this property had been in the family for close to 75 years, the family lawyer was working behind the the backs of family members and engage in, in a series of conveyances. I was going to ask you to assist us. Can you enlarge it a little? Is that possible? Just slightly. Not too much, but just. I don't know what I'm doing. 
it's not the whole piece, but it, I can go up as necessary. No, Mr. Brown. Please continue in respect of the that part of exhibit CNLB four that is displayed at page twenty four. Mm -hmm. So th this shows the. Um, the pace at which the this shows the pace at which Eric Jones was moving to claim ownership where uh, December the 9th was the date of the indenture. Uh, we don't know who Julian Cornelius Jones is, but we believe it's Eric's father. Uh, a conveyance uh, from him to join Alfred Virgil on December the 9th. Uh, December 9th, he was signing off on an indenture granted to John Augustus Alexander Virgil exclusive ownership to Lot 4, which he is now using uh, to convey portions to, to, to others. And so we saw this as working behind the scenes to, uh, to lay claim when there was no sales agreement, there was no conveyance. Uh, between John Augustus Alexander Virgil and Eric Jones. Now, let, let us uh, start at the very beginning. I need you to, this is top of the page. Yeah. It says from Julian Cornelius Jones. In respect to that name, you are not, the beneficiaries are not familiar with that person. No, not not confidently. Uh, we've only had anecdotal um, information around his connection or this person's connection to Eric Arthur. Did you find any conveyance or any other transfer to Julian Cornelius Jones? We did not. We... Um, we observed this transaction or this, um, this note of this transaction from the Butterfield report. Okay. And it's the source for the, the remaining conveyances on this slide. Okay. Now, you had taken us through this page, but I just make reference to it. To the left of this table, there are some notes that you had placed reliance on. Could you just let us go back through them based on what? Certainly. Um, Please speak in the microphone for me. Yes. So it indicates that Jones conveyed, or that he drafted conveyances uh, for weeks leading up to the date of this missing indenture. And uh, I've indicated in the presentation that the indenture to support Jones's claim to the southern portion uh, is missing. So he was drafting conveyances. Uh, as seen in the table here for weeks leading up to um, January 24 of 62. Six conveyances were prepared for various lots of the southern portion between December the 9th and January the 24th. And John Alfred from Somerset, as you can see from the table, he was a party to um, at almost a half a dozen of these conveyances. And these con six conveyances, you have proof of, of them? We don't have the actual conveyance in hand, but we relied upon some information in the Butterfield report to support our position here. Okay. 
And the Butterfield report that you refer to is exhibit CNLB8. Could you take us to the CNLB8, that exhibit, and take us to, through to any facts that you place reliance on in respect of the conveyances prepared by Eric A. Jones? Yes, if the, um, if the commissioners could make reference to page six just of the- just, just going to try and have it projected for them to make that easier. But you direct us to page six. Of the Butterfield report? Yes. It's um, paragraph 31. Okay, just, just give us a moment, please. Certainly. You said page eight. I said page six, but uh, paragraph thirty one, which we're close to. Here we go. Okay. So, um, thank you. Paragraph 31 speaks to a voluntary conveyance, 19th of December, 1961, where Eric Jones conveyed... Just read for us what, what's there first, and then you can give us a, okay. your comments, please. Certainly. By an indenture, a voluntary conveyance dated 19th of December, 1961, Eric Arthur Jones conveyed Jones lots two, three, and four, shown on plan E, into the joint names of himself and his wife, Elizabeth Hedrick Jones. In an indenture, did you? Please continue. Please. In an, by an indenture of voluntary conveyance dated 28th of December, 1961, Eric Jones conveyed Jones lot number six, shown on E, to himself and his wife. Sorry, just read as it appears there for me, please. Into the joint names of himself and his wife, Elizabeth Hedrick Jones. Thank you. Paragraph 33, by an indenture of conveyance dated 23rd of January, 1962, Eric Arthur Jones and Elizabeth Hedwig Jones conveyed Jones lots four to join Alfred Virgil in consideration of the payment of 750 pounds. By an indenture of conveyance also dated- I'm 20 sorry, just for completeness, you're on to par what paragraph are you on to now? Uh, 34. So, so we started at paragraph 31. Yes. And you're going through, you're at 34 now. Yes. Okay, thank you by an indenture of conveyance, also dated 23rd of January, 1962, Eric Arthur Jones conveyed Jones Lutz one to join Alfred Virgil in consideration of the payment of 750 pounds. Paragraph 35, by an indenture of conveyance dated 16th of October, 1962, Eric Arthur Jones and Elizabeth Hedwig Jones conveyed Jones lot 
two to Vivian de Costa Sweeting and Gloria Yvonne Sweeting as joint tenants in consideration of the payment of 1,100 pounds. Paragraph 36, by an indenture of conveyance dated 28th of June, 1965, Vivian de Costa Sweeting and Gloria Yvonne Sweeting conveyed Jones Lot 2 to John Alfred Virgil in consideration of the payment of 1,500 pounds. Paragraph 37, by an indenture dated 20th of December, 1961, Eric Arthur Jones conveyed lot five to Julian Cornelius Jones in consideration of 750 pounds. Paragraph 38, by an indenture dated 13th of June, 1966, Julian Cornelius Jones conveyed Jones lot five to Joan Alfred Virgil in consideration of 1,500 pounds. By an indenture dated 15th of April, That's 19... paragraph 39. Sorry, yes, paragraph 39, by an indenture dated 15th of April, 1966, Eric Arthur Jones and Elizabeth Hedwig Jones conveyed Jones lot six to Joan Alfred Virgil and Muriel Dorothy Wilhelmina Virgil as joint tenants subject to a mortgage which has since been discharged in consideration of the payment of 3,500 pounds. And that concludes the reference to the flurry of conveyances. Now, in respect of plan E that's mentioned because you took us through paragraph 31 through to 40 of exhibit eight. Plan E that reference is being made to. I'll come back to it shortly. I have had the, the plan E, but I'll come back to it. Oh. Let's make a note for me. I'll come back to it. Oh. 
No, the earlier document you had shown to us, which is a title schedule of conveyances, I had taken you to, I had taken you from there to place reliance on the things that you had summarized. You had summarized some things in a chart mm -hmm. and we had gone through that process to have a look at the supporting evidence. I take you back to the chart and as soon as, and shortly I'll draw your attention to what is referred to as plan E, which shows the plan regarding what you have just said. I'll take it to you shortly. Now, let us return to Exhibit 7, CNLB 7, which is your schedule of evidence by letter or tab number reference. You make mention at page three, page three of exhibit seven. And you have stated in that document that a probate of a will for the estate of Thalia, Thalia, and Harvey, who is deceased. Mm -hmm. The fact that Mr. Motier represented the estate of Thalia and Harvey, and at the same time provided legal services to John Augustus Alejandro Virgil. You posit that that is an indication of where Mr. Mottier was involved. What exactly do you mean? I, I, I've given you the an instance based on the exhibit where you have said that the attorney represented the estate of Thalia and Harvey and also represented John Alfred Virgil mm -hmm. and at the same time providing services to John Augustus Alexander Virgil. What mm -hmm. is the purpose for which you make that point in but this document? The, the purpose for making that point is that we believe that John Alfred from Somerset, that he was the imposter. He was the gentleman that was willing to pose as John Augustus Alexander Virgil. And we needed to demonstrate that Modia had um, provided legal services uh, to Alfred or had some um, legal exchange with him. And so this probate in, with respect to the Thalia Harvey's estate shows where John Alfred is the son and sole executor of the named person in this bill and that Robert Murdia signed off on the document, including making uh, or signed off on an amendment and the, the actual document in 1959.
Now, sir, you may continue. We're on page three of exhibit seven. Okay. Under the heading title deeds to the property showing title changes from 1880 through to 1945. Could you take us through yes. that um, page? So page three, um, reference E, uh, is a, a description of the high level pages in the title deeds from 1880. And um, in some reform, the, the deeds package that we hold shares where George W. Young sold the property to Samuel David Robinson in 1880. And then Samuel David Robinson sold it to Augustus Virgil in 1885. And then Augustus Virgil and his wife took out a, a mortgage in 1887, another mortgage in 1896 with David Trimmingham. And then in 1924, so a further mortgage with Kerry Grisset. Just a moment, sir. Gents, Madam Chair, I'm just trying to see if we can project it to provide some assistance. Madam Chair, it's a paper intensive exercise. I'm just trying to ensure that all the aids are being utilized to assist the commissioners to view the documents. Uh, the chair and commissioners quite understand. Thank you. Yes, thank you. At page three of exhibit seven. 
yes. under the reference E. Yes. yes. Could you just take us through? We just, we have located the exhibit and we have projected it on the screen. Okay. Um, so uh, exhibit E, reference E, the title deeds to the property, showing the changes in title from 1880 through to 1945. And in 1880, George W. Young sold to Samuel David Robinson. In 1885, Samuel David Robinson sold to Augustus Virgil. 1887, Augustus Virgil and his wife took on a mortgage with Henry Robert Hurst the house and the land, 1896, Augustus Virgil and his wife mortgage with David Trimmingham for a cottage and a parcel of land. 1924, Augustus Virgil and wife to Carrie Lloyd Grisset for mortgage of parcel land and a dwelling. And then in 1926, Carrie Lloyd Rousset to Roderick Alexander Ferguson, and then the reconveyance in 1945 from Roderick Alexander Ferguson to John Augustus Alexander Virgil and others. Thank you. And you have a motion to approve. Document there that has all these title deeds in them. Correct. It is labeled title deeds 1885 to 1945. That's correct. I was going to ask you to have a look at it again mm -hmm. and you can just share with us. I know there are some tabs there indicating, some blue tabs indicating some years. You could just share. Certainly. The, the blue tabs that are attached to various pages in this exhibit indicate the years of the cover page of each one of the, the deeds that was just um, described in the exhibit four. Okay. And so it is 1880, 1885-1887-1896. 1924, 1926, and 1945. Madam Chair, I'm going to ask that, <clears throat> excuse me, that document which is labeled Title Deeds 1885 to 1945. which has in it <clears throat> title deeds that Reliance is being placed on by the witness, showing title changes for the period I mentioned. I'd ask that it be tenor admitted as exhibit CNLB 10. 11? I'm, I'm advised it's 10. What will? What do you have for the flurry of conveyances? Pardon? I'm advised that that may be advise that you may be what counsel uh, I, i'm sorry i'm sorry it was such a motion i, I apologize I, I, mr brown was okay. asking us to just to give him some guidance he he thought that we may have miscounted and he was asking me just to check 
for a particular item and the designation by way of exhibit that has been given to it. Right. Are we at exhibit nine or exhibit 10? We have it as 10, but the witness had asked about a previous item that I was going to ask him to repeat and we will check for that designation in the interim. What were you referring to Mr. Brown? Um, we were under the impression that the flurry of conveyances uh, in December 61 and thereafter with Eric Jones was uh, CNLB 10. And just so that we were on the same page in terms of the references. So do, do you have the flurry as an, as an exhibit? When you said the flurry, you refer to the document you have there, which has title deeds. Is that no, your... the one prior, which shows Eric Jones conveying property to John Alfred from Somerset. It was um, it was the table. Oh well, well that the not... table, just for the record, is contained within exhibit four. exhibit four. Okay, then. And four. I had made specific reference to page twenty four. Yes. So it's it, that is within. Okay. And already an exhibit. Okay. Apologies for any. That's fine. That's fine. Yes. Thank you for clarification. So, so let me let me speak sorry. to this then. Title D's 1885 to 1945, uh, which is being relied on on the witness showing the title changes for the aforementioned period, is hereby entered as Exhibit C and L B 10. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes. Just a moment, please, Council. I I don't know if there's a correction here. Is it 1885 to 1945 or 1880 to 1945? Ask the witness that question because I realize that Exhibit Seven has a figure which is distinct from the the. That which appears a label on, on the actual exhibit. Right. So if you uh, ask and uh, uh, Mr. Brown, a correction if necessary. In, thank you, Madam. In respect of exhibit C and LB7, which we are going through the schedule of evidence, on page three, on the item description, it has title deeds to the property showing title changes from 1880. Whereas on the exhibit which was just before us, exhibit 10. It refers to the year 1885, which is yeah. correct. Is it 1880 or 1885? It's 1885. Yeah. Uh, the 1880 was just to illustrate from whom Augustus Virgil purchased it from. Um, just to show the link, but okay. we're, we're content with 1885 being the starting date. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just for completeness, Madam Chair, in respect of Exhibit 10, at page three of Exhibit 7, a list exists which outlines what is contained in Exhibit 10.
Now, should I make a note of that, Council? I'd appreciate it. I think it would be easier to cross-reference it at a later okay. stage, Madam. So I put just cross-reference page three at exhibit seven. Yes, Madam. Can I just leave it at that? That's sufficient. It's just a listing of that which is contained in exhibit 10. So my note shows cross-reference page three at exhibit 10, seven, Purpose. listing a listing of that which is contained in exhibit 10. Thank you very much, madam. Now, Mr. Brown, can you tell us the purpose for which you have placed reliance on these title deeds, sir? The purpose for which the beneficiaries are placing reliance on the title deeds it's because it's the, it's the heart and soul of the ownership of this, this matter. It is, the, it is these deeds which Uncle John left to his nieces and nephews, which has been the, the guidepost for them, and it has been the, the energy that has uh, kept them steadfast in their pursuit of justice. And in respect of ex same exhibit seven, which is exhibited on and projected on the screen, you have some notes there. Could yes. you just make reference to them first? Sure. Um, the commissioner should be aware that the, the beneficiaries have been in possession of these title deeds to the property since 1972, when Uncle John Pass. Uh, these deeds suggest that the transactions after 1945 would require these deeds in order for them to be legitimate. And we speak of the 1962 claim to ownership by Eric Arthur and the 1969 transaction with Russell Perman and John Swan. So the deeds provide the beneficiaries with a, a valuable instrument in their claim to ownership. Um, as non-lawyers, we have learned that you need the deeds to um, lay claim to, to, to the property, and, and we accept that. Legal claim. Yes. Thank you for the Because you, you can claim anything. <laughs> now, we're at page four of Exhibit 7. Yes. Could you continue at, at uh, reference F? Reference F is a another one of the reports that the beneficiaries have relied upon. Um, That's where we started this morning. That's where we started. Yes, yes, it's where I'm, we started. Just with... taking us offline for a bit, but we're back here. Continue. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Um, so the Bermuda Caribbean Engineering Consultants Report is a report that the, the beneficiaries, in their wisdom, uh, they felt it was appropriate to retain the professional services of a local chartered land surveying company that had the skills and expertise to conduct an investigation into property title. And their investigation was based on official records held by the authenticating government agencies. Now this report is an independent private sector report. Um, it was commissioned in 1996 and they were asked to conduct the necessary research and report back on the findings regarding the extent of real property held by John Augustus Alexander Virgil. The report as we refer to it as the Summers Report, because the author was David Summers, we affectionately refer to it as the Summers Report. So the Summers Report describes all ownership and subdivision of the subject land from 1885 through to 1962. And the subdivision and the evolving ownership 
that's expressed in mat form, as you may recall um, from reviewing that report. And it was included in the presentation of last week. This report concluded that John Augustus Alexander Virgil earned lot four as at 1972, and that there were no officially registered transactional records of John Augustus Alexander Virgil dispersion of any part of the land after 1962. So from 1962 until he died in 72, there's no record. And in 1972 till today, there's no record. And these two transactions that are the subject of our presentation are in these windows, post-1962. And so the, um, this conclusion, it conflicts directly with the conclusion in the Butterfield Report that speaks to ownership of the property. So again, this, the, the research in the Summers Report did not reveal who Russell Perriman was acting on behalf of when he made the application. It also, uh, when he made the application to the Central Planning Authority for subdividing the northern portion of this subject property. And the record did not reveal how or any part of the subject property came into the possession of John William David Swan at the time that he voluntarily conveyed six lots of land to, to Leslie Ming. So the, the Summers report is quite a critical one in as much as it provides insight into the ownership as reflected in the government records, which would have been filed by the, the lawyers and the real estate agents so engaged at the time on any transactions. Okay, so can you just point us to the point made by you on page four? of Exhibit 7 that the BC's BCEC conclusion conflicts directly with the conclusion in the Butterfield Report regarding ownership of land by John Augustus Alexander Virgil. Can you show us both reports and point out to us Certainly. what you have concluded is a conflict? Certainly. Um... On page six, on page six of the Summers report, the indulgence. The, what is referred to as a Summers report? Yes, Madam Chair, was tended as an exhibit this morning. It is CNLB. That's eleven. No, no, Madam Chair. Was the first exhibit this morning? I'm just trying to get the designation of exhibit number. I see. Four. Four, five. CNLB five. The witness is making reference on to CNLB five. I see. And he will shortly, and it's exhibited on the screen. He will shortly make reference to CNLB-8, which is a Butterfield's, Butterfield report. The witness has indicated that there's a direct conflict with the conclusion in the Butterfield report regarding ownership. I have asked the witness to point, out, point us to the two exhibits, CNLB-4 and CNLB-8. Is it four or CNLB-5? Five, I stand corrected, five, uh, uh, five and eight. So Brown, okay. when you're finished. Right? Yeah. Okay, so the Summers report states that- Can you just point us where- On page six, sorry. Thank you. Um, That's it, the research, the conclusions. So if we, if we uh, refer to the conclusions on page six of the Summers report, you see the second paragraph, 
It says, it is concluded herein that John Augustus Alexander Virgil earned lot four shown on Annex Plan 7 of 24th of January, 1962. Uh, please, please slow down first, thank you. I know it's there, but please. Okay. Yes, uh, pl please, please start again. Okay. It is concluded herein that John Augustus Alexander Virgil earned Lot 4, shown on the annexed plan 7 on the 24th of January, 1962. John Augustus Alexander Virgil died on the 17th of January, 1972. So this report concludes ownership. Um, and then the Butterfield report in its conclusion say that- Can you just direct us to the page and paragraph number yeah. possible? It's page nine, the last page of the Butterfield report. Just a moment, please. Just, just, just. just going to is allow us just to project it just before you proceed. So you said the last page, page nine. Yes, there you go. Go up. The last paragraph says, however, the point is academic. Yes, please proceed. Okay. So the the Butterfield report, the last paragraph of the last page, the report dated thirtieth of October, 1978, reads as follows. However, the point is academic because as we have stated, apart from residual worthless interests in certain roadways, we do not believe that John Augustus Alexander Virgil earned any part of the sad track at the date of his death. Thank you, and can you just direct us to just remind us what the tract, what the tract, um, the, the, the acreage and the size of the tract. Certainly, um, and, and Kansu, we have to make a distinction here because the, if we turn to page 23 of our handout from Thursday. Just, just one minute. I just ask you to not to forget that point. Yeah. But I think importantly, the the said document that it references being made to CNLB eight, whereas the conclusion at the end speaks about the said track. I mm -hmm. think that they, I believe, not given evidence that at the beginning of the said document it speaks to what it is that they are looking at the track. Correct. But but I'm saying hold your point. I'm just making reference to that. But you, you, you proceed with your drawing our attention to exhibit four, page, what page on exhibit four? Um, 23, it says claim of ownership as of 24th of January, 62 by Eric A. Jones. Just having it projected, Madam Chair. Right. 
Yes, thank you. Yes, that'll, that'll be fine. Um, so, commissioners, if I can draw your attention to this slide in front of you, ownership following conveyance dated 24th of January, 1962. The Summers report says that John Augustus Alexander Virgil had a legitimate ownership to that which you see in front of you known as the northern portion. The southern portion where Eric Arthur Jones has laid an ownership claim as of the 24th of January, 1962, there is no sales agreement or conveyance. But the Summers report acknowledges and places value on a memo from David Wilkinson's office in April of 1969. That 1969 memo, which we discussed at our last meeting, does not in and of itself legitimize the transaction of ownership or claim to ownership of the Southern portion in and of itself. But we acknowledge that the Summers report grants Eric ownership. We take issue with that for reasons we've stated. But for full disclosure, we share with you that point that the Summers report acknowledges that Eric had um, a claim to the Southern portion we take issue with that claim because it is not supported with any legal instruments, although Mr. Summers includes it in his presentation. Yeah. You want to make that clear because as far as we're concerned, it's the southern and the northern portion, and we need the southern portion to be legitimately documented as being earned by Eric Jones in order for the northern portion to connect in terms of the transactional data that is being offered. So that's an important point that may, we may revisit further down. Okay. Uh, we take issue with Summers claiming Eric has ownership of the Southern portion, but we acknowledge that he states it in his report. Just as we take issue with several statements in the Butterfield report, although they are included there, and we'll take those as we, as we find them. Thank you. The document that you refer to, specifically the memorandum, which it appears that you wish the memorandum to be treated a particular way. You, you, in my words, the mere fact that somebody says something doesn't make it in fact. So, yes, the memorandum. Just remind us which memorandum that is. Let us have a look at it now. I know you referenced it on the last occasion yeah. by way of presentation of Exhibit Four. But can you just? Remind us of it, and we'll go to it. Certainly, it is. Um, it is the memo that was crafted by David Wilkinson and sent to the um, the Registry General's office in April of 1969, a full seven years after the transaction supposedly took place. David Wilkinson files with the Land Registry Office for all intents and purposes a memo. 1969, claiming that Eric Arthur Jones purchased the southern portion of Lot 4 from John Augustus Alexander Virgil. Please take us to the page just so I can, so we can have it presented. The page 21 is in front of the commissioners on the screen. Thank you. But it's page 21 in exhibit four. So this memo from David Wilkinson does not rise to the standard of legal integrity required in order to authenticate the transaction that claims ownership to the southern portion. It is, this is the only documentation 
of any legal flavor that we have been presented with. And so we submit again that the 69 piece, the Southern portion from the 62 transaction, sorry, 62, um, is not legitimate, although Mr. Summers reflects it in his report as being so. Mr. Summers was not retained to investigate the legality of transactions. It was the, the recording of transactions re, which relates to title that he was charged with, not to uh, investigate whether or not the transaction took place above board. That was not his remit. Thank you. I wish us to, I'm going to draw your attention to the document so it may be tendered as an exhibit. Council, Madam, you're asking me to do something? Yes, I was just waiting, Madam. Oh, okay. I wish to I'm getting you. bring to the witnesses' attention a letter dated the 19th of February, 1969. Is it letter, memorandum? No, excuse me, um, Council. Are we speaking to the southern portion? No, I, I'm, I'm going ahead of myself. I'm okay. speaking to the northern. My okay. apologies. Pray oh, okay. of Still seven years between the two, mm -hmm. but that's a, a date stamp. Mr. Brown, the date of the document, just remind me. The one, the northern portion, I was referring to the, the what, what we refer to as the, 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 I'm sorry, what we refer to as the memorandum. What's the date of the memorandum you refer to? Um, it was, I don't know. It was recorded by the Registry General's Office the 7th of April. 69. 7th of April, 69. And recorded by David Wilkinson's office, having been received back from them on the 15th of April, 69. Okay. I'm just trying to ensure I present the right document. Just a second. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. okay. than in the past. I don't know what that is. It looked funny. Yeah, it's like a camera. Mm -hmm. I think it's this. I think it's. Memorandum recorded.